Hi, welcome to episode three. After 35 days, we are now ready to go into space, and this is the vessel that's going to do it for us. This is Curse Stock One, and uh, Curse Stock One uh, has some things I want to talk about in a little bit more detail than I have in the past. And one of the things I want to talk about is the delta V numbers that are up there towards the top left. Uh, before I've been doing the delta V sort of by feel, but now that we are wanting to achieve an orbit, we have some hard numbers to go by. Now in the stock game, getting into orbit takes about 4,500 meters per second of delta V. I am playing with the near uh, aerodynamics mod and Ferrum also is kind of in the same ballpark. They only require in about 35, 3,600 meters of delta V meters per second of delta V in order to get where they need to go. And if you take a look at my first two stages, there's 1,060 meters per second in that first stage. That is the uh, solid rocket boosters that you see. And then there's a further 2,587 meters per second for a total of 3,648 meters per second. So those first two stages should get me into orbit. Then the 113 meters per second, that's at that top stage. That is there just to allow me to sort of finish off my circularization and uh, allow me to also deorbit the vessel in order to get what we done. So we have a total of 3,761 meters per second. That should get us up into orbit, back down again. Um, we can see my two missions that I have off to the side, the two contracts. They are to reach space and to achieve an orbit around Kerbin. And also, if you look at the bottom right, you will see that I am right at the top end of the weight that I'm allowed to have on my launch pad. I'm at 7.9 tons, and the launch pad can only take 18, so this is right at the top. And in fact, I had to do some sacrifices in order to get there. If you uh, take a look, you will see there's no science on this thing at all. No, none of the mystery goo containers. Um, I wanted to take some up there, but I had to make a choice. It was mystery goo containers or those parachutes to recover the stages and I decided I can get the mystery goo stuff later I want to recover my stages and save me some money and there's a couple of other things I want to show you as well uh, one of them is over here at the administrative building uh, I was eyeing the uh, fundraising campaign and now I have it so 25 percent of my reputation gained from missions will now go to raising funds so that should help things out and the other thing I wanted to show you is that I have upgraded the uh, Academy building and that means that my Kerbals can now do EVA so this is just in time I can now get up into orbit and I can be able to do some EVAs up in orbit and collect some science from some low orbit EVAs over various biomes. And here we are on the pad uh, the original plan here was actually to have Jebediah be our first Kerbal into space, of course, but uh, once I got the EVAs unlocked, I realized I was probably going to collect a respectable amount of science in this mission, and I thought using our scientist Bob would be more in order. So Bob is on this mission, which means he has no uh, SAS capabilities at all, which gave me the second reason that I wanted to do this, is I thought, well, you know, might be a little bit more challenging without the SAS, might be a little bit more of a reason for comedy. Now those people that are used to flying these rockets and getting into orbit on the stock aerodynamics, they're used to going straight up to probably around 9 or 10 kilometers and then knocking your pitch over 45 degrees uh, and, and going from there. Uh, that's not going to work with realistic air physics. If you did that, your rocket is going to split in half, or the rocket is at least going to flip out and it might end up splitting in half. What you have to do is do this more slow, proper kind of gravity turn. To be honest, I should be turning quicker than this, but uh, yeah, that was dramatic. Those were the uh, rocket, solid rocket boosters coming off. I don't know what's going on with these now. This has been like that since 0.25. But anyway, um, Back to where I was, I should be actually pitching over further than this, but if you take a look, I have the yaw over as hard as I can go, which means I am holding down on that D button. The issue is, is once this thing is up to speed, those fins have no control surfaces on them whatsoever. This thing just wants to go straight. And in fact, you know, uh, I'm concentrating on flying this so much that I actually, I was planning on just cutting off at around 80 kilometers when my apoapsis gets up to about 80 kilometers and I was concentrating so much on my flying that I shot right past it.
I'm noticing now that I just hit a go. What I got 107 kilometers. I cut my engines, and now the thing to do is to coast to uh, my Appalapsis. Uh, here's the notification saying that my solid rocket boosters were covered, so that's fantastic. And also, this is my first Kerbal to kind of get up to this really top part of the atmosphere, and you can get away with doing an EVA. Now, make sure he hangs on. It's a little bit risky, but you do an EVA, and there's my EVA in the upper atmosphere. Of course, I want to get right back in there again. And uh, here we're just going to speed up forward picking up some science along the way, but the idea is just to get up to Apoapsis. We're collecting some science in space. And as we close into around 30 seconds before the top of our trajectory, we want to start burning. And I like to put the pitch right down to zero below that. Uh, some people I know go to map view and they and they set up a maneuver node and all that kind of stuff. But that this to me works just fine. And uh, as the apoapsis gets closer, I start to burn. And the idea is to keep an eye on that time to apoapsis and not to let that get below zero. So you want to keep the apoapsis ahead of you. You can thrust up uh, or, or increase your thrust to accomplish that. You can also pitch up, as I'm beginning to do here to accomplish that. This is a little bit trickier, again, because I don't have SAS. That always sort of helps. But overall, this is going pretty good, and I'm watching my periapsis height. And of course, what I want to do is get that periapsis up above 70 kilometers. And once that periapsis is up around 70 kilometers, that's it. You are in orbit. Now, the thing is, I don't want this lower stage to stay in orbit. So I want to keep the periapsis when I separate into the atmosphere. Um, so ideally, I don't know, I, I like to get it up, whatever works, I get it, I think I detach here around 25 kilometers, there we go, so I cut the engine, detach, there's my top stage, fire up that engine, the torque's a little bit wilder now, so a little more harder to control, but I do manage to get a hold of it, and thrust it just to finish off my orbit, Bob's doing the best he can without having SAS. You know, that torque from the capsule is all that's causing this thing to steer, but it's such a light little rocket that every little adjustment causes it to shoot one way or the other. But there we are. We are in orbit. And now comes the time for Bob to do his first orbital EVA. Um, there's no stabilization to this craft, so it just keeps tumbling. And I've already gotten a water EVA, so um, I'm looking at that peninsula that's coming up. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I know that I can probably pull out a grasslands and a shores there. I have to say, I do like the view. This skybox, I wish I can remember the name of the person who picked up this skybox, or, or where I downloaded this skybox from, but I love that sort of galaxy there. Um, the other thing I like, too, is that... Um, the galaxy is in the same orbit as Kerbin's orbit, or in the same plane as Kerbin's orbit, which gives you a nice sort of point of reference. It's not off at some random angle. So here I am. I'm just sort of spamming the EVAs until I get a Shores EVA, and then I'm going to do the same thing and get a uh, Grasslands EVA. And this is going to continue for a while. I'm going to get as many EVAs, as I, over as many biomes as I can. There'll be a highlands one that I can get easy enough. There'll be a mountains one that I can get, a deserts one I can get. Unfortunately, my orbit's not such that I can end up getting um, the badlands. That's a very small, but uh, just as valuable biome to get. And of course, this is an equatorial orbit, so I'm not going to get uh, either the polar or the tundra orbit or biomes. One thing to notice as well is that I've switched Kerbal Engineer over to uh, the surface mode and it's showing you what biome you're over. So that's really helpful. You can uh, just warp around until you get to the biomes that you want to get. So now uh, Bob has gone around and collected all the science that he can uh, doing EVAs over the various biomes that he can reach, but now it's come time for him to come home. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to time warp here. You can see I'm in the map view. And I'm going to time warp over to the other side of the planet. That red dot 
is the Kerbal Space Center. That red dot actually is provided by Remote Tech, which is a mod I'll be talking about in some detail a little bit down the road. But right now it's giving us a nice target to aim for. And I like to get myself pretty much 180 degrees, a little past that actually, uh, from the Kerbal Space Center. And then I'm going to burn retrograde and get that periapsis down about, uh, I don't know, around 25, 30 kilometers or so. And hopefully that should work out pretty well. Um, there is a great mod out there called Trajectories, this, which does work with 0.90, but uh, as the mod, so many of the modders have done, uh, they've, they've made it so that you have to upgrade the tracking station before it works correctly. So for now, I have to eyeball it. So right now I'm burning, you can see my periap starting to come around. Um, and what the Trajectories model, uh, I didn't even say what it did, what it does is it takes into account the uh, aerodynamics and and the rotation of the planet and tells you where you're going to end up hitting the ground or at least a pretty good estimate of it so it takes a lot of the guesswork out of this but I am guessing right now so I've done my burn and uh, now it's time to time warp uh, to the point where I'm going to be entering into the planet or entering into the atmosphere of course And there we go. And now it's time to ditch this service module, which is just that tank and that engine. I'm just going to land the capsule. So I like to always turn to one of the normal vectors when I do that. It pushes the um, tank out sideways. Actually, I pointed up. That works just as well. So that I, I, I hate to, I don't want to detach when I'm pointing prograde or retrograde because then what you just discarded is in your path. And that could not, might turn out badly. So turn 90 degrees one way or the other. I'm having a bit of a challenge with all the torque that's in this capsule and just the weight of the capsule trying to keep it on the prograde vector but eventually as the atmosphere starts to get thicker and thicker the natural aerodynamics of the capsule will take over and that will help to keep it oriented correctly. And now that we're down below 40 kilometers, you can see I'm starting to get some of those heating effects. You can also get a good view here of the heat shield. That heat shield is provided by uh, the Deadly Reentry mod. And it is more or less necessary, not 100% necessary, actually. This capsule would have survived, but to be safe, it's good to have it there. Um, this is actually looking pretty good. I always find that if I'm getting a little over 30 kilometers and I start seeing those mountains, I'm doing pretty good. Uh, there's the temperature rising on that heat shield, and that heat shield getting a nice healthy glow of red. I am doing some, or Bob really, is doing some major deceleration. And by this point, of course, I am providing no input whatsoever as far as steering this craft goes. This is completely steered by aerodynamics and gravity. The one thing that is important to realize is to make sure that with deadly reentry, you do not want to have that parachute armed at this point at all. Um, you can see the message now have come up not to uh, deploy that chute. That chute will break if it is deployed right now, and then there's no way out. Bob is going to not have uh, a very good time, as they say. But this is actually looking pretty good as far as getting to where I want to go. And we are now really starting to slow down. The heating effects have gone, and all i got to do now is wait for that uh, warning to go away. I'm coming right over the Kerbal Space Center pretty much right now. Oh, this is this is sweet. And there the warning is gone. I can deploy that chute. Just waiting for it to fully deploy. There it goes. Once it fully deploys, I like to ditch the heat shield. You can detach it. There it goes. 
and that that's not recovered but uh, you lose a little bit of weight I mean I think all the less weight you can the best uh, I just picked up a flying overgrowth and here I'm trying to get a flying EVA and now you know why I'm not that good at first-person shooters because I really panic and I hit the water and yeah Bob came out of it okay I realized afterwards that this was complete nonsense I already had a flying over the water EVA way way back so okay that that so the, the, I mean this could have gone worse and and I kind of want to get back into the capsule I don't know I don't I could recover both of these two things separately but I want to get in there I don't know why just out of completeness I suppose that you think you should be in the capsule at the end but this doesn't quite it becomes a little comical he gets yeah and I give it another try but pretty soon I realize that you know as as fun as this is who knows I might end up glitching Bob into an early in, into an early grave with this kind of stuff so eventually I just give up and recover both of them separately all right and now it's science time and with our 155 science we have quite a bit to choose from here so we've got the flight control I definitely want to get that it's got fairings it's got air brakes reaction wheels and it's got better control surfaces so I can actually steer my rockets as they go up that's uh, a useful thing to be able to do of course there's the uh, general science down here at the bottom general science has got most importantly the materials bay for pulling in more science it's also got some batteries and some other goodies there's also the general construction that's second from the top which is also a very useful uh, one to unlock it's got the struts and it's also got the launch clamps in it so those end up being the three that I end up going for they, they turn to be the ones that are most useful I left the advanced rocketry at the top alone it's got some bigger more powerful engines and some bigger more powerful fuel tanks but for now, I'm still going to be just fooling around in low, low carbon orbit. There's a lot I can do just around there with what I got. So I think the three that I unlock here are the most important. And then it's time, of course, to spend those build points we got from unlocking those three nodes. And I got a bit of a plan to, to make use of the space plane um, hangar. Uh, kind of, so I, I, I throw a point there. And then I'm umming and awing about where to put the other points and it was right around here where I begin to realize that I had not been putting the R&D points into um, being able to research the tech faster, but instead I had been putting those R&D points into having building points uh, generate science points instead. And I clicked once and then realized my mistake and then right clicked on it thinking maybe that would take the point away, which of course added my one remaining point. So now well, that was well done. So I end up deciding to spend 12 science to generate two more points and uh, put those points towards the researching the tech quicker as I should have been doing from the first place and, uh, and the, also the space plane hangar. But we're not quite done with this mission yet. We still have this uh, first stage that we need to... Uh, deorbit this piece of debris and I'm not sure about other people but I, I hate debris I, I'm really kind of OCD about it I can't handle debris being hanging around in, Ker in Kerbin's orbit I don't even like it when it's out in solar orbit so I need to get rid of this thing now I had hoped that it would have been it's low enough in the atmosphere that KSP would have removed it and then the automatic recovery system would have taken care of it but uh that didn't happen, so I decided, well, I'm just going to have to ride this thing down to its destruction. And that's exactly what I was expecting to happen was its destruction, because I did nothing as far as tweaking the parachute values. I thought that, uh, you know, it would open up at about 0 .01 atmospheres, which would have, would have been way too high. A deadly reentry would have destroyed the parachutes, and this thing would have plummeted to its demise. But right around here, I was starting to doubt that. I was starting to realize that those parachutes should have opened by now and I began to realize that that time when I was playing around with the parachute uh, values which was in the last video um, those numbers seem to be consistent. They stay that way until you change them to something else even though this is a different ship and I began to have hope that this might not have a bad ending after all and so I kept following it down with my hopes rising And 
then lo and behold at around the three kilometer point and I went on to recover this stage normally and then it was Jeb's turn so this is uh, Kerstock 1 again. The only change I made is that I replaced the nose cones on the SRVs with those stack decouplers because I had a contract to test them on the surface. Otherwise, it's the same thing. And even with the SAS now enabled because Jeb is a pilot, I actually had a tougher time flying this than I did before with Bob with uh, no SAS. And the reason was because of the lack of nose cones on the SRVs. This thing became a little less stable. It was a little uh, more difficult to keep it flying in a straight line. Um, I know in the stock physics the nose cones actually slow you down more than anything. And you don't even need them. Uh, here you need them with the uh, more realistic aerodynamics model. Now this mission has another uh, objective, another contract to fulfill besides just testing those decouplers. And that is the Vostok 1 historical mission that comes with uh, the Mission Controller 2 mod. And uh, yeah, the mission here is to simply get into orbit, do a single orbit, and to come back down. This is, uh, of course, in reference to the original Vostok 1 from 1961, in which Yuri Gagarin was the first man in space and did an orbit and came back down. So now Jeb is following in Yuri's footsteps. This mission is a carbon copy of Bob's mission, but I was looking forward to Jeb doing his EVA instead uh, because, you know, I could lock that, that ship down. And what I like to do is I could I like to turn it normal. It makes it easier to come in and out of the command capsule. And then I noticed, of course, once Jeb's out, yeah, the SAS doesn't work anymore. You know, I don't, I, I gotta be honest, I don't quite get this. What, like, they can't just push a button which kind of keeps those reaction wheels locked in. You need somebody constantly on the stick to just keep steering it. I mean, seriously, it just doesn't make any sense to me. But this mission went without a hitch. Um, and here we are in re-entry. I did want to show kind of the cockpit view. This is the raster prop monitor uh, mod, which is great. They give you lots of these little buttons that for, you, for you to play with these monitors. You can actually fly an entire mission. Just by looking at the displays, they give you live and useful information as you're going through this. I'm just pushing some buttons here. One of the really neat things is if you uh, get one of the mapping mods like ScanSat, which I'll be using later, you can have the map show up on there and project your position. And this is me looking out the window and looking at the stage that I uh, ejected. You can just see it down there, or maybe you can't. I know I can see it anyway. And now we're in the final part of our descent. All of this went without a hitch, except for one thing. Um, although it's not obvious from this shot, I actually am on the wrong side of the conduit with the Kerbal Space Center on it. Uh, I just wanted to show this just to sort of... Uh, let you know that, uh, you know, I did get a little bit lucky on that first landing. And from space, we uh, go to a rather weaker mission. This is what I had cooking in the space plane hangar while the vehicle assembly building was uh, cooking up the Vostoks. And this is Rod Bart. He's uh, the, the, the fifth of my Kerbals that I have so far, the, one you, the only one you haven't met yet. Uh, he's a scientist, and he's out here in a command capsule with a uh, materials bay and a couple of goo canisters, and obviously just collecting science from the runway. This is a free mission, because when I recover this, um, I will get 100% of the value back. And so he's just going to run around and collect stuff, and uh, after he collects an EVA from the runway, he's going to run out and go out to KSC and then I'm gonna have them run out to the administrative building and collect some an EVA over there and it's only 2.2 per one and I started to get pretty tired of this so after that I just simply came back and called it a day and now on to our final mission of this video this is curse doc 2 and there are a couple of things to take note of here number one is that I have upgraded the launch pad so I am no longer 
uh, un have to be under that 18 ton limit. Uh, though this particular vessel is under the 18 ton limit because I designed it before I had upgraded the launch pad. Uh, a couple of important notices notes about this vessel though. Number one is it has the improved tail fins. You might be able to see them flapping back and forth a little bit there. Uh, so I have actual control surfaces now and it has reaction wheels plunked right into the middle of the launch stage. So uh, I have a lot more control of this vessel than I've had of the previous couple of vessels. And this launch profile is a little bit more along the lines of what I like to do when I'm playing with something like Near or with Ferrum, which is to start pitching over right off the bat. And I aim to have hit about 45 degrees when my altitude is about 10 kilometers. So you can see here, I can probably pitch over a little bit quicker than I am. And when I get in around, uh, oh, I don't know, 40 kilometers or so, I like to be down to about a pitch of 10 degrees. So it's a gradual pitching over, kind of trying to hit those benchmarks as I get up with the idea, of course, of cutting my throttle once my apoapsis is above around 75 kilometers or so. And we perform our normal circularization burn with the idea of ditching this first stage before uh, our periapsis is outside of the atmosphere so that it will deorbit itself and not leave any debris. I don't have any parachutes on this because I don't have the uh, park count. I'm still restricted by an 18 park count, so I couldn't get the parachutes on there. Um, and the other thing I did different is I am intentionally about six degrees off from going due east because I wanted to go in into, into an inclined orbit with the idea of hitting that Badlands biome and doing an EVA from low orbit above it. Now our pilot Manuki has two main objectives to fulfill in her contracts. One of them is to collect science from space around Kerbin. So in order to ensure that I do that, I put a single goo canister on there um, that Manuki is right now collecting the science from so that she can store that in the command module. Just like with our previous mission, the whole service module is going to be deorbited. Uh, only the command module is going to come down. And I, I wanted to get the goo in there because uh, I could easily have missed collecting the EVA science over the Badlands. But an interesting thing happened while I was spamming away on the EVA button to try and collect that science over the Badlands is I happened to catch the Tundra. And I know there's a couple of places on the map where this happened, so that was pure luck. So I decided I would just go with that. Now the second part of this mission was to fulfill the requirements of the Vostok 2 contract, which are that our pilot needed to stay into Kerbin orbit for a two full Kerbin days, which is a period of 12 hours. So in order to prepare for that, I ended up stacking this thing with batteries, but I read the electricity requirements of the command capsule wrong and ended up putting on about five times the number of batteries that I needed to in order to have this work. So yeah, so Manuki has power to spare, so to prepare, she ended up bringing up a whole bunch of movies, so at least she'll be entertained while she's floating around in that capsule. And here I am getting the science over the Badlands as well. So this ended up being a pretty awesome success. So with that, we will bring this episode to a close and we'll see you next time.